You're the center of the universe. Everything was made in you. Jesus, breath of every living thing. Everyone was made for you. Let's do that again. And you're the center of the universe. Everything was made in you. Jesus, breath of every living thing, everyone was made for you.
Father, we want to thank you for our times of praise and adoration, Lord God. We want to thank you for meeting our hearts, Father, where they are, Lord God, and then bringing them, Father, closer to you. And Father, we acknowledge this morning that we need to hear from heaven, Lord God. We need to hear from you, God. And part of the reason we've come here, Lord God, is for you to do a work within us, Lord, through the word of God. So we pray this morning, Lord God, that, Father, today we would become more like Jesus, Lord God. Father, not just words, Lord God, but the living word. Bring, Father, forth your truth, Lord God, and minister to your people, Lord God. Help us to hear, Father, what you would say to us, the church, the body of Christ, Lord God, today. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. We are glad you're here this morning. Before we go into God's word, because we're not going to go into first, we're in the Gospel of John on Sunday morning, but we're not going to go there this morning because of Thanksgiving. But I want to remind you, as a Christian, Before we go into the Word of God, that the Word of God is living and powerful. This means that when you take in the Word of God, it plants itself in your heart and begins to transform you. In other words, it doesn't let you stay the same. God's Word begins to change you from the inside out into the image of Jesus. That's been my prayer since the day I became a Christian. That every single day that God will work in me and make me more like Jesus. Now there's times that he's worked really quickly and other times it's been a drill. And my heart has been like cement, but God has been working still. And until the day that God calls us home, he's gonna work in you and in me. The power of God's word is evident in the lives it has transformed. People who were once society's cast-offs, men and women who were looked upon as hopeless and worthless, have been changed and healed by the power of God's word. This was done by simply taking it in and meditating on the truth of the scripture. By it, depression was lifted, hearts were mended, minds have been transformed, And lives have been changed forever. And this is to continue in each one of us. Our prayer this morning needs to be, Lord, work your powerful word in our hearts as we open our hearts to you and we trust you, God, by faith in the living God. Now, we live in a time when we need to more than ever, see clearly again through the truth of the lenses of God's word. It is a time that we need to be inspired and empowered by the truth of the word of God. So this week, we will celebrate Thanksgiving. It is a special time to remember and be reminded that we need to be thankful to God and for what God has blessed us with. You may say this morning, which every one of you probably is thinking, it's been a difficult year. Amen? Amen. We all have to admit that we have lived in and are living in a difficult and anxious times. This year has been one of the most different and difficult and uncertain times for many in their lifetime. I've never seen anything like this in my life. But for us as Christians, we don't live in uncertain times. For God's word, his truth makes us certain that he is in control. I can honestly say I do not fear what is happening in our world today and in our nation. And it isn't because I'm a brave man. 
is because I believe God and his word. As we look ahead to the days to come, I believe we will continue to see difficulty. But we can look at the difficulty two ways. First, as an adventure with God at the wheel, taking us through these places, and we can be excited and expect God to do great things, and that's how I'm feeling today. I want God to be in charge of the wheel of my life, of the wheel of this church, to take us to a place of where, wherever God wants to take us. And there'll be exciting times. God promises that. And God will be faithful. Or, number two, we can have the attitude of, I just want things to return like they used to be. And be miserable and very unhappy, even possibly for the rest of our lives. Because fear will set, us, set in, anger will arise, and depression, and discontentment will captivate us. And I see this happening to some people. I personally believe that things are not going to return to what they used to be like. And I am glad as a pastor... Oh, pastor, you just want things to be hard, and that isn't it. Let me tell you why. Because for so many, God has used this last year to awaken them. But while some have been awakened, more still, who are Christians, are sleeping. Beloved, this may seem like an impossible thing, but it is true that there are many Christians who are sleeping through the testing of our nation and this world. They continue to walk in their flesh, live for the world, and even continue to build their own kingdom. And they don't even realize that God's kingdom is coming soon. I'm saddened as a pastor. Now, because of what we have has happened, Many don't really want to celebrate Thanksgiving because they feel there is nothing really to be thankful for. But they are looking at this from only a physical realm, not a spiritual realm. This morning, I want to celebrate with you Thanksgiving as we are reminded and retaught that we have to be thankful for and what we have to be thankful for in the physical realm and the spiritual realm. I want to first of all remind you of why we celebrate Thanksgiving and why so many today want to skip it and just go to Christmas, which they also try to change concerning the truth of the, the birth of the Savior of the world. Real history, and you're going to see why in just a moment I say that, is this concerning Thanksgiving. In 1621, pilgrims joined together with Native American Indians on New England soil to enjoy a feast celebrating the pilgrims' very first harvest. Plymouth Governor William Bradford made provisions for a day of prayer and thanksgiving. So according to history of America, the reason why we celebrate Thanksgiving is to thank God for his blessings. Now, history tells us that George Washington, when he was president, declared this proclamation. Listen to it. It says this. Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits and to humbly employ his protection, his aid, and his favor. Now, therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November next, to be devoted by the people of these states to the service of this great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all good that was, that is, or that will be, that we may then all unite in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for his kind care and protection of the people of this country 
and for all the great and various favors which has been pleased, he has pleased to confer upon us. So according to history of our nation, Thanksgiving is a time that we acknowledge God's blessing on our nation, which many are undeserved, unearned, just because of God's grace. This is why we celebrate it. And this is why many people today do not want us to celebrate Thanksgiving. I want to share this with you before we go on. The Bible teaches that you're either in God's family or you are not in God's family. In other words, you're either a Christian or you're not a Christian. And the Bible says there is a God of this world. The Bible teaches that there's only two sides. There's not 15 sides or 2,000 sides. Everyone has all this little club or this little... God says you either belong to God, you are, he is your father, or you belong to the devil. That's just how it is. Well, I don't like that, Pastor. I'm sorry, you don't like it. Take it up with God. And in that, many times what we see with our eyes is different what is behind the scenes. It is a spiritual thing that is happening to our nation. And the things you see that are happening are spiritually driven. And in this driving, they are trying to, in every single way they can, to remove God and any thoughts of God, any inclination toward God. And this is why they are trying to destroy our history as a nation and put in a brand new history. They are literally saying and teaching that Christianity was not what the nation of the United States was founded on. History tells us totally the opposite. Almost every single man who signed that Declaration of Independence, and they were bright men led by the Spirit of God, were Christians. And every one of them, even Thomas Jefferson, believed in the Bible and the importance of the Bible and its morality. Now, God desires for us to be thankful as Christians. So I want to look this word up with you in the sense of what the true meaning, the fulfilling, or more, fulfill, more full, concerning this word called thanksgiving. Because as Christians, if there's ever been a time we need to be thankful, it's now. This word literally means an expression of gratitude or grateful, acknowledgement of something received by or done for one another. So this is what Thanksgiving is about. Being grateful to God for all his blessings, for all that God has done and all that God will do. So let's stop for a second. And let's look at ourselves and ask ourselves, are we thankful to God for what God has done and what God is doing? Every morning when I wake up and even when I go to bed at night, I have a person that lays beside me. I know it's Jesus and I know you know that yourself too. But I have a wife that's been with me for a long time. And as I'm laying there, one of the first things I do is I thank God for my wife. I believe that a woman, a good woman, is a blessing from God. And a good man, good children, I believe all those things. But I want to thank God because I am blessed in that way with a good, a good woman. I thank God for my children every day, for my grandchildren. I thank God for this church. Many of you, I thank God for your commitment to him and your walk with him. I thank God for the president that we have, and I go on and on and on. I'm thankful to God. And it is important that we understand that we need to be thankful. And again, I ask this question to you. Stop for a second. And ask God, am I a thankful person, God? 
Or am I a discontent person? Am I a miserable person? It's important that we understand this. Why is it it's so important that we understand this? Many psychologists concur that being thankful is the healthiest of all emotions. Being thankful is a key component of healthy relationships. So I think it's pretty important that we're thankful, don't you? But we must be careful that we are not thankless. The word literally means no feelings or expression of thanks. Ungrateful. Not producing, not likely to produce thanks. Unappreciative. One of the things I am going to share, and I'm running ahead of myself, and I need to do this, is America. We are born in America. There's no greater nation. And if there's ever been a time we need to be thankful, and I'll explain that to you in a little bit, we need to be thankful for being born in America. I have found it to be true that unthankful people are miserable to be around. They constantly complain. Nothing ever suits them. So God desires for us to be thankful. So what, as Christians, do we need to thank God for and continually be thankful for? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 28 and 29. This will be our first thankful truth because he loves you Romans chapter 8 and you're going to be flipping through your Bible so you better have your Bible handy we have six or seven more scriptures that we're going to look up Romans 8 28 says this for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What an awesome scripture. He loves you, and this must be personal. Yes, he loves the world, but you must know this in your heart, and God wants you to know how much he loves you. You've heard of me speak of my children and my grandchildren and people that I love and people in the body of Christ. And you just want to them to know how much you love them and how important they are in your life. And God is the same in a greater extent. He desires for you to know how much he loves you. There are so many people who do not experience the love of God each day because they really don't believe that God loves them the way he says he does. Stop and think this morning. Do you really believe and accept the greatness of God's love that we read this morning that no matter what life brings towards you, that it's not going to separate you in any way or even put a twinge in the greatness of God's love for you? You can know something and never really experienced in the way that God intended because of three reasons. First of all, one, unbelief. Number two, not knowing the truth. Or number three, walking contrary 
to what will bring that truth into your life. The first one, unbelief. Some say, I don't believe God loves me because I know how I am. And he could not love me like he loves others. How many have ever thought that? I think we all have, haven't we? God loves you not because of who or how you are, but because of how he is. His love has nothing to do with you. That's an amazing concept. If I can just get that in my spirit and keep that in my heart, that God's love, the way that he loves me, has nothing to do with me. It's because of who he is. And God's love is perfect, unconditional. The second one is not knowing the truth. There are many people today who do not know God's love and does not know that God loves them in any way. Our world is in a tornado and spinning. And it's throwing out people and they are so scared and so messed up and so hopeless. And they need to know that God loves them. Many of them, and this is an amazing thing, thought, living in America, many have never heard the gospel. From the age of about 45 years and below, the gospel has not been presented. People's parents stopped going to church and taking their children to church. Those generations and below have not heard the gospel. I know you might think in America, everybody's heard about Jesus. It's not true. There are neighbors who are Christians who have never shared with them about John 3.16. In the book of Matthew 28, God tells his people to go forth and make disciples the reason why, partly, is God has left you here as a Christian today and not just taking you home is because God wants you to present the gospel. That's how it is. And there are so many of your neighbors, your friends, your relatives, who have never heard the gospel that God loves them. We all know John 3.16 for our own personal self. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's a fact. But God says, I'm to share that fact with so many who have never heard. And the third one is walking contrary to what would bring the truth of his love into my life. The book of Jude tells us this. Keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. In other words, keep your heart toward God in a place where nothing stops the flow of his love to you and the blessings he has for your life. So what is really, I'm really saying to you is that my choices in going against God's word and living in my own ways literally can hinder God's blessings of love flowing to my life. That's why many times people ask this question, well, why does God bless them? Why is God blessing them and not blessing me? Well, the many times we stop the blessings of God because of the choices we make with our lives, especially against the word of God. Now, how important is it that we know and experience God's love? You know, the Bible teaches that God is love. But I believe that the number one thing God wants us to know, because it's so important, it affects every area of our lives, is knowing the greatness of God's love. Listen to what 1 John 4 says, verse 17 and 18. Matter of fact, turn there. I'm waiting for you. 1 John is toward the end of the Bible. Chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. This is what it says. Love has been perfected among us 
in this, that we have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Beloved, in this verse, God is not telling us a bad thing. What he is telling us is, here is the antidote for the fear that all of you have to deal with sometime or another in your life. What he is also saying is that you need to grow in knowledge and acceptance of God's love every day. I believe that fear is being spread by the words of others and the fear of others in our nation today, without a doubt. In the book of 2 Kings, these words are spoken of by one of the leaders of the enemies of the people of God who have surrounded the city of Jerusalem with about 200,000 soldiers. This is what it said. Thus says Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Do not let God in whom you trust deceive you. In other words, don't let what God says in his word lie lie to you and believe what he says. Saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hands of Assyria. Beloved, what they were doing And this was planned. They were trying to put fear in the hearts of God's people so they would give up their freedom and they could control them and they would become their slaves. As I hear the words of many people today who I believe have purposefully used fearful words to put fear in people, it can be a powerful weapon against God's people. We need to quit listening to the lies of the enemy and hear and read God's word of truth and love, and that will keep us from the fear brought by words. If there's ever been a time that our nation has been enveloped by fear, by the words of people, it is today. And God doesn't want you to be one of them. In 1636, amid the darkness of the 30-year war, a German pastor, Martin Rinkert, is said to have buried 5,000 of his parishers in one year. An average of 15 Christians a day. His parish was ravaged by war, death, economic disaster, In the heart of that darkness, with the cries of fear outside his window, he sat down and wrote this table, Grace for His Children. It goes like this, Now we thank our God, with our hearts and our hands and our voices, who wondrous things has done, in whom his world rejoices, whom from our mother's arms have led us on our way with countless gifts of love, and still ours today. Here was a man who knew thanksgiving come from the love of God, not from outward circumstances. Let's look at a second thing that we as Christians need to be thankful for. I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through 26. And this second part literally means... Forgiveness. Thanking God for forgiveness. Romans 3.21 says this, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and all who believe. For there is no difference from all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, 
being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation or a payment by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at this present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So this is talking about forgiveness. Justified means being as if we've never sinned. God desires to forgive. If you are a Christian today, if you've accepted Christ and you've become born again, the Bible teaches all your sins are forgiven you. And that includes all of yesterday's, all the past. Whether people remind you, or your own mind reminds you, or the devil reminds you, God says you're forgiven and you're cleansed. And the Bible teaches it's as if you haven't sinned. How does God do that? I don't know. I just care that he does. The Bible teaches that he puts my sin as far as east is to the west where he remembers it no more. How does God do that? I don't know. I'm just glad that he does. Now, spiritual life starts at the forgiveness of sin. My relationship with God starts at the forgiveness of sin. My relationship continues to be close with God as I continue to deal with my sin because I will fall short and I will need to repent. In other words, I am going to continue to miss the mark and I need to be forgiven by God no matter how long I have been a Christian and there is no sin for a Christian that cannot be forgiven. Imagine if you were not forgiven by God. How the guilt of sin and condemnation of sin would wear on your soul. David gives a great example of this when he tells us in Psalms that how he kept silent concerning his sin and how it caused his bones to grow old. Through his groaning all day long, he says, from day and night your hand was heavy upon me his vitality was turned into the drought of summer. He said, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity, and I have not hidden it. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave me the iniquity of my sin. You know, we don't have to go through that. We can learn from David's example, but what we have to do is deal with it honestly before God if we are in sin. Because this is how we will feel. God doesn't want us to stand guilty before him, our walk in guilt, our walk in condemnation. But in the freedom that God has bought. The third one I want to share with you is the Holy Spirit. That we need to be thankful for the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, listen to what it says. Or do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Every Christian has been given by God the Holy Spirit, which seals them and places God's ownership on them. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? So when the devil looks at you, he sees God's ownership, the seal of the Holy Spirit. But that isn't the only reason God gives the Holy Spirit. He equips us to empower us so that we will be the witnesses that God desires us to be. I need the power of God more than ever, and God makes himself available to enable me and you all day long. The Holy Spirit is the kind of like a light switch when you need light, you turn it on, and it reveals things more clearly. But we need them all the time to empower us for any victory. Now, what can happen is that we can turn off 
the Holy Spirit by grieving him or by quenching him or resisting him. And we've all done this. There are too many Christians today who allow their flesh to rule their lives. And you can tell this by what is coming out of their lives, the fruit of their lives. All of us can tell if we are walking in the flesh or in the spirit by the fruits of our life. In the book of Galatians, the Bible talks about the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, mercy, these are the things that the Bible says are the fruits of the Spirit. And I can tell if I'm walking by the Spirit if these fruits are coming out of my life. But of anger and resentment and bitterness and all these other things, the Bible speaks about people who walk in the flesh. These are the things that are come out of your life. That's how it works. Again, I say that we have the Holy Spirit, but we need to let Him empower us to love, and to be who God has called us to be. Stop for a moment, beloved. And think and ask yourself, how am I doing concerning the Holy Spirit? Ask him to show you your desires. Am I desiring differently, God, than what you want from me? And have I quenched you or resisted you and said no to you, God? Because let me say this to you, and please listen. The Holy Spirit is speaking to his church and to the body of Christ and speaking to you individually also. And you must yield to the Spirit of God. What is he saying to you? Because you know. Let's look at another one we need to be thankful for, the grace of God. In 2 Corinthians 12, I love this scripture. This is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. And it helps me through every single trial I go through in my life. Every single trial. It comes back up. It pops up. Here's where it says, Concerning these things, I plead with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong, or he is strong in me. Beloved, this is Paul speaking. And what he is saying is that whatever is thrown at, my, at me in life, God knew and will be strong in me and give me all the need to handle it rightly because of his grace. We are all going through something in our lives. And we need to believe God and take him at his word. And that he will give us all that is needed. For God is faithful and God is promised. So whatever trial you are going through or will go through, God will be there and he will pour grace into your hearts allowing you to go through successfully and bring glory to his name. One more thing. Acknowledge your weakness so he may be strong in you for beloved, we are all weak. And that's something that literally every one of us need to remember. When you look at another Christian, you may think that person really is strong in God. They really walk with God. You can see they don't flutter. Why is that? It is partly because they believe that they are weak and only God can be strong in them. That's how it works. But it's hard for us to acknowledge we're weak. I don't think any one of you in this room this morning could get up and say, you know what? I'm just such a weak person. And sometimes we say that out of pride. I'm so weak. But it's really not true. But I will acknowledge this, what the scripture teaches here is this. If you will acknowledge your weakness and depend on God, God will be strong in you. God promises that. And let me tell you, beloved, you need God's grace. 
Just a couple more to be thankful for. That I am part of the family of God. Ephesians says this, chapter 3, verse 14. When I think of the wisdom and the scope of his plan, I fall down on my knees and I pray to the father of this great family of God. Some of them already in heaven and some down here on earth. What a great scripture. Those who share the same spiritual father are related to each other. They have been born again. There are people who have been born in him in the past, and there are people who have been born in the present, and there are people that will be born in the future. These are all the family of God. Now, it is an honor to be able to call God Father. And I can because I am his child, and if you are a Christian this morning, so are you. God has other children beside me. Those we call brother or sister, and I am to treat them as family. Maybe the family that I grew up in was very dysfunctional. That is not how God wants us to treat one another. I believe that God changes us through the scripture to be fully functional. If you are still dysfunctional the way you were, when you became a Christian a year ago or two years ago or five years ago and you're not functioning with discipline in your life, there's something wrong there. God's not going to say, get saved and just stay the same. It's not going to happen, I promise. I believe that God changed us through the scripture to be fully functional, not staying the same as before we were Christians. As this happens, we are to treat one another with love, Esteem one another better than ourselves. Forgive one another. Pray for one another. Defend one another. Give to each other. Just to mention a few. That's all in the scripture. Every single thing I just said. Today we can have a tendency to isolate ourselves from other Christians. Or just pe people in general. Don't do that because it'll affect you spiritually, physically, and psychologically. That's how it works. We are the body of Christ, and every part is as important as the other. You need other Christians. They're finding out that our children, and this is just recently, they say that this generation, because of not being able to go in school and be with other people, are going to have some serious problems in the future, this set of children, because they can't be or not with other people. They're being hid in their homes. Just a short reminder, you are going to live eternity with all those brothers and sisters in Christ. So you better start getting to know them now and love them now. Now, let's look at another one. We need to be thankful because Jesus is coming for us soon. I want to read a scripture to you, and you know it well. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep or have died in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means proceed those who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I believe that this is ha going to happen soon. The Bible teaches that this is the next prophecy that is going to happen. Now, 
Some say, well, pastor, you just want to escape. Yes, I do. And if you want to stay, go ahead and stay. Let me tell you why I want to escape. After the rapture of the church, I believe, some don't, but I do, that the book of Revelation is going to be unfolded right before this world. The judgment of God, the wrath of God on a nation or a world, I'm sorry, a world that he created and he loves is going to be judged by God. And if you want to look at the judgment that God's going to put on this world, start reading Revelation chapter 6 all the way till chapter 19. Now, I want to remind you of something. No person has to go to that ju judgment of God. Jesus took on the judgment of sin for mankind. We choose, our person chooses by rejecting the gospel, the good news that God has sent a savior in the world. And because of that, they have to pay for their own sins. But you as a Christian, born again believer, will not see the wrath of God, I believe. And yes, it is true, I do want to get out before this. And I am thankful to God that I will, my wife will, my children and my grandchildren. Not because of me in the sense of they're going to get out because I'm a Christian and I'm a pastor, so God has to let them in. There are no grandparents in heaven. There are only children who've accepted Christ. My children have accepted Christ. My grandchildren have. They're going to heaven because of their relationship with God. So I am grateful for the rapture that is going to happen. Number seven, we need to be thankful to God that he'll deliver us and all his children. Listen to what 2 Timothy 4 says, verse 17. But the Lord stood with me, and he strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me, and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lions, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Everyone of you as a Christian need to claim the scripture. God has promised that he will deliver you from every evil work as a Christian. And he will keep you for his kingdom, heaven. Amen? Now, the last one. We need to be thankful that we live in America. No matter what anyone says, especially those who hate America and try to change it, was founded on the Bible. Christianity, and because of that, we still live in the greatest nation in the world. There is no better place to be born and to live in. I know we are headed down, and I know that we are going fast. And I know that evil people are beginning to be in places that I pray that God will remove them. And I know that lawlessness and violence are happening in our nation. I know that. I see it. And it saddens my heart. And it even makes me mad. I think about all the people that gave their lives and sacrificed to have this great nation. And it saddens me bad. But it's still the best place in the world to live. I promise you that. I love America because of what it used to stand for. I don't love it like I love God or my wife. America is not first in my life. But it has blessed my life and it has blessed your life. And the quality of life, like no other place. If you think America's bad, 
why are so many people trying to get into America? So we need to love the place that God has either had us born in or moved to. Some people have asked me, what is God going to do with America? Let me tell you what the Bible teaches really quickly. God has to downsize America. What do you mean, downsize, Pastor? That means that God has to take us from being a superpower. We can't be dominant like we are. God has to remove us. Let me tell you why. For there is no speaking concerning America in prophecy. But there is Russia. There is China. There is Iran. There is Turkey. There is Sudan. There is Libya. These are all things, uh, nations that God speaks about in the Bible that God will use to fulfill prophecy. America isn't. And in that fulfillment of prophecy, God will bring these nations to come against Israel. And if the United States was a superpower, guess where we would be? Right between them, out of the will of God. So God has to remove America. And he's doing that and allowing it to kill itself with a cancer. A removing of God in every way. And in this next year, you're going to see it escalate, I believe. And that's why it is so important we understand concerning these things that God has spoken to us this morning that we believe God concerning these. I've given you eight things you should be thankful for. Take them in your heart this morning and let the truth of them grow in you. And then thank God every day and live them. And they will deliver you from whatever you need to be lit, delivered from. Well, remember, what sets us free? The truth of God's word. The world today is discontent, miserable, and unthankful. You and I don't have to be like that. And God doesn't want us to be like that. See the truth of why we are to be thankful and begin to thank God this morning. I say this again. Christians should be the most thankful people in the world, especially American Christians. But that's a choice this morning that I must make. Let's bow our hearts this morning. Father, I'm sure that all of us this week or this month complained about something, Lord. And our hearts weren't probably thankful, Lord. But now that our eyes have been opened and our hearts have become softened, Lord, toward your truth, we want to thank you, God. We want to thank you, Father, for loving us. We want to thank you, God, for your grace. We want to thank you, Lord God, for all that you bestow upon us as your children, God. And Father, continually remind us, Father, to be thankful, Lord God. And Father, if there are things within our heart this morning that we need to allow you to take out of us, Lord God, please do that, Lord God. Please, Lord. We thank you that we are your children, we belong to you, and that we can call you Father. There's nothing like the relationship we have with you, God. So continue to work in us, God, and make us those children who are part of the family of God, Lord, more like Jesus, as we surrender our hearts and minds and lives. And Father, last but not least, 
Please, Father, and fill each with the Holy Spirit again, Lord, and again and again, Lord God. And Father, remind us to walk in the Spirit that we may not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. In Jesus' precious name we pray, Father. Amen. I have a question for you. Are you part of the family of God? Are you a Christian? Have you accepted Christ? The Bible speaks, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The gospel is so simple that a child can receive it. And it removes the wrath of God. Must believe that Jesus came down from heaven, that he died for your sins. Must believe that you're a sinner. Ask God to forgive your sins and ask Christ to come into your heart and live, and he will. Listen to what Revelation says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears his voice and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. You become the temple of the Holy Spirit and God comes in and lives in you. That's the only way to go to heaven, beloved. And every person, every individual has to do this themselves. So if you haven't done that, please do that this morning. Let us stand this morning. If you need prayer this morning, we will have pastors up here and Tony will be up here to pray for you if you would like prayer of some kind for being sick or whatever you need prayer for. Something in your life, they would love to pray for you. So as they come up here, if you need prayer, they would love to pray for you. If you want to come up to the altar this morning and talk to God, please come up. We give you the invitation to do that. Our worship team is going to play a few songs. So it is an honor to come up and be with God. It's an honor to hear from God. It's an honor to kneel to the altar of God and spend time with God here. It's a special time. So we encourage you to do that this morning. And as you leave this morning, remember who you belong to. Remember your family. We'll sing a song and be dismissed. God bless you. Have a blessed day.